And then I'm going to just do one more housekeeping item. My name is Todd Wilkinson. I'm the project manager for JRBP and our executive director, Brent Stock, is on tonight as well. And we are again, happy to welcome you to our first of the 2022 series, the speaker series. And we have a great program for you tonight. I uh, would ask that you keep your cameras and your mics off uh, during the program. Uh, if you have a question, go ahead and, and uh, type it into the chat box down at the, the bottom. And when the program's over with, we'll read through those questions first. And I'm sure there'll be some time uh, for some extemporaneous questions as well. But uh, we'll, Brent and I will be monitoring those just to see you know, when we're ready for questions. So it looks like we've got a fair amount of people already on. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Skylar and let him get started. You're ready, Skylar? Yeah, absolutely, Doug. Yep. All right, well, our speaker this evening, Skylar Bachman is the Upper Current Interpretive District Ranger for Ozark National Scenic Riverways. He began his career in 2008 as a naturalist with Missouri's Department of Conservation before going on to manage Twin Pines Conservation Education Center located in Winona, Missouri. A lifelong resident of Shannon County, Skyler enjoys passing on the family tradition of outdoor recreation to his children, Harper and Hattie. The Jacks Fork, Current, and Eleven Point Rivers are their playground in all seasons. And it's my great honor and privilege to introduce Skyler. It's yours, take it away. Thank you, Todd. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Todd had said, my name is Tyler Bachman. I um, have been the upper current district ranger now for two seasons, two years uh, with ONSR. Uh, my time with uh, the Park Service actually started well before then. Uh, so I had mentioned in 2008, or in my bio, I had mentioned in 2008 uh, that I had started as a naturalist with NBC. But before that, uh, in college, being from Shannon County, I uh, had worked seasonally for the park, both as an interpreter at Allie's Mill, and then also got to wag around a weed eater a couple seasons. So got to see all ends of the park from uh, different positions. Uh, as Todd had mentioned, uh, my son and daughter, they spent a lot of time with me out on the riverways, whether that be on the current, the jacks, or the Forest Service run 11 point. Uh, interesting fact about them is they're actually the seventh generation of my family that grew up right here in Shannon County. So uh, we predate the Civil War time. Um, here in the Missouri Ozarks. And then another fun fact, if you didn't know, uh, Brent Stock and I are actually related. Uh, Brent and I are third cousins on my mom's side. So uh, she had actually come down in the season of 79 from Perryville, Missouri uh, to be a seasonal and then had met my dad. So if it wasn't for the Park Service, I wouldn't be here. And if it wasn't uh, for my position now, obviously uh, my children and I wouldn't be living in the area. So uh, tied in uh, pretty pretty thick with the park, you can say. Uh, so I will go ahead and kind of throw the warning out there. Uh, for the federal government, we're not uh, allowed to use Zoom. Uh, for our meetings, we use Microsoft Teams. So through the pandemic, uh, became very, um, uh, very good at working with Microsoft Teams. Zoom, I may be a little clumsy on. I'm going to share a screen here in a moment for the presentation. Uh, but if you do have questions, as Todd had mentioned, uh, he and Brent will be taking a look at those. And I do invite you to go ahead as we work through the presentation tonight. Uh, don't be afraid to fire those questions off to me. Uh, Todd and I, we have presented quite a few times working with the uh, ACA material with our paddling clinics. And one of the things that we commonly find between the paddling clinics and even the evening programs that Todd has helped with is that uh, the nomenclature here in the Ozarks can sometimes throw folks. So if I happen to use a term or say something that you're unfamiliar with, uh, take a moment to go ahead and drop that into the chat. And that way, while it's still fresh in everyone's mind, we can address that and hopefully clear up anything um, on the communication front. Other than that, uh, any general Q&A, you can wait till the end and ask. Uh, again, this is an activity that I do get a lot of questions about having grown up in the area. Uh, again, uh, spent a lot of time in a boat as a youth uh, from 10 on up. Uh, my dad and my uncles would take me. And so I was very versed in the art of gigging. Uh, but as I moved away from the area, uh, whether I was going to school or traveling, I quickly realized that most had never had the opportunity uh, to one, go gigging or two, even knew what the uh, sport of it was. 
So again, uh, as we do move through the program tonight, please, please uh, feel free to drop those questions into the Q&A. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I do believe that the main part of the presentation will be up for everyone to see, uh, and I should have a thumb up in the top right-hand corner, and Todd's nodding yes, so I think that I have that right, so bear with me. There we go. All right, Brent, Todd, thumbs up, we good? Okay, excellent. Okay, so uh, again, going back to the bio, uh, Todd had mentioned that I had started my uh, formal career or uh, full-time career, you should say, after school uh, with Missouri's Department of Conservation. And we were having a conversation uh, before the presentation got started about the fundamental differences between the agencies. So with the Missouri uh, Department of Conservation, uh, it was really ingrained with me from the education perspective of conservation, you know, being that wise use of the resource and tying that into the landscape. And as I transitioned into the National Park Service, you deal a little more with the preservation side of things. And so with a national park being right here in South Central Missouri, one of the unique things about it is it's one of the few parks that you'll find across the nation that actually uh, marries the concept of that cultural history, uh, that conservation, that wise use of the resource, along with the preservation. And so it's kind of a melting pot when it comes to national parks. And it's not really like any national park that you're gonna find uh, anywhere else. So the park itself uh, came to be in 1964. Um, just historically, if you take a look at the times, uh, the nuclear family was in full swing and so was the nuclear uh, vacation. And that was really taking off. And a lot of folks were vacationing around water. And at that time, it was a very popular concept to start damming up riverways. Uh, across the nation, they did so, one, for that tourism dollar, but then two, it was also a way uh, to provide energy uh, to the grid at these dam sites. And the current and Jacks Fork River uh, were no exception. Uh, they were viewed, uh, there was plans in place to dam these two rivers up, and thankfully for us, uh, was one of those uh, where a group of interested individuals, um, the broad term was a group of businessmen out of St. Louis, but they came from all walks of life from various parts of the state and the region, but they did band together and were able to get legislation uh, in place to protect not only the Jacks Fork and the current river, but also the 11 point. Uh, in the early 1960s, there was some debate on how these three streams and rivers were going to be managed. Uh, again, talking about different agencies having different mindsets, uh, the Forest Service had a very different background than the Park Service. Uh, so once the dust settled, the Forest Service ended up with the 11 Point River and the current and the Jacks Fork fell underneath uh, the National Park Service and the Ozark National River way, or Scenic Riverways was founded. So with the current and Jacks Fork, we currently manage 134 miles between the two rivers. Uh, approximately 88,000 acres. Um, and then in 1972, uh, the park was essentially finalized when Missouri State Parks uh, came forth and said, you know what, we'll go ahead and donate our three big, our three main state parks. And they actually were the three first state parks uh, in Missouri's history. And that was Big Spring, located in Van Buren, Alley Spring, located uh, roughly six miles west of Eminence, and then Round Spring, where my office, uh, or at least my district, is located, and that's 12 miles north of Eminence. So once those three were added, the park, uh, as you know it now, was essentially complete. Uh, now, again, going back to uh, the bylaws of the park, once it was founded, it was one of the few parks that was actually written that the cultural history and the recreation in the area would mold how the parks um, uh, uh, resource was going to be managed. And so from a uh, resource management background, it was very interesting to come in and realize that we have different user groups, whether that be the paddling uh, with kayaks and canoes, uh, the equestrian use with horses, we have the uh, jet boat use, which a lot of that will be throughout this program this evening. But it's very interesting to see not only the history of the area, the tourism in the area, but how that 
has molded and shaped the park into what it is today. So again, throughout this presentation, we will be talking about the sport of gigging. Uh, we will be talking about some of the regulations that are established by the state of Missouri, but we're also going to be tying in uh, the history of that Scott Irish uh, culture and that heritage, how it came to be in the Ozarks and how it's still alive and well today uh, through this sport and through this park. Okay, so the migration uh, of the Scott Irish into the Appalachian area really took place just after the Revolutionary War. Uh, we still didn't have a lot of folks making their way into this part of the world until uh, after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, uh, we started to see more settlers coming into the Ozarks out of the Tennessee area. In fact, a lot of the lineage that you will see uh, here today does come directly from that Tennessee uh, area. And in fact, a lot of historians can tie a lot of practices and uh, talked about nomenclature earlier or language that we use to that Tennessee culture. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, the new Ozark settlers quickly learned to adapt to their Appalachian skills of hunting and fishing and boating to this new environment. Uh, they also came in close contact with a lot of the native tribes as well. And it's very interesting to see uh, where the drop off of some of that Tennessee culture ended and where some of those uh, native cultures really started to have an impact uh, into these new settlers. So as they made their way into the Ozarks, one of the things that they realized was water was abundant. Uh, there was a lot of, as we say, hills and hollers, uh, no good way to get anywhere. Water was the primary source of travel. And one of the real unique things about the Missouri Ozarks is that we do have a lot of ridges. We do have a lot of valleys. Uh, but when folks see these mountains in the area, a lot of them assume that it's from tectonic activity. But again, going back to that water that we have in the area, every bit of the landscape that you see today is carved from the water that has been here for millions of years. So when the settlers came in, they quickly realized that if they were going to get supplies from point A to point B, uh, again, going from a bottom or a river bottom up over a ridge top down to a river bottom again was not that effective. It was a lot easier just to float their supplies down river and then pull their way back up. And then well into the 20th century, uh, residents do recall, and this was very interesting to me, uh, because in the 1940s and 50s, we were still dealing with a lot of individuals that were using the old John boats, which you see in this picture here, as a form of transportation. And again, they recalled floating down to a township or an area, uh, another farm that they may know, and trading for goods and then pulling their way back up. So a lot of these individuals base their entire life around that river network. So throughout these early slides that you'll see, uh, you will notice the flat bottomed uh, John boats as we call them. Uh, they got their name from an uh, individual out of the Donovan area, uh, one uh, named John, but he had developed this flat style uh, wooden boat that was used to transport uh, goods up and down the river. And then on top of that, recreation was based out of it as well. Uh, these boats uh, early on were pretty, uh, they were always narrow, a little shorter, but as years went on, they saw the lengths of these boats uh, start to expand into that 26, 30 foot uh, long stretch. And if you think of 26 to 30 foot, um, again, typically whenever we're giving this program, I can get a show of hands, but uh, if any of you have been in a canoe, uh, typically you're dealing with anywhere from 16 to 17 foot, uh, usually not uh, much bigger. So if you're dealing with a 30 foot John boat, imagine two canoes, uh, bow to stern, bow to stern, essentially uh, in length. And that gives you an idea of just how long these boats were. Uh, one of the unique things that uh, when doing my research on, uh, you know, the practice of gigging, again, growing up with it, I really didn't have any concept or background to it, but it was very uh, interesting to me that a lot of the length had to do with one, uh, how shallow the water would get in certain areas, especially after the uh, big logging boom that ended in the 1920s and 30s. 
uh, we started to see uh, the river get a little more choked uh, with rock, debris, gravel coming off the hillsides. But they had adapted these John boats to get longer and longer to float in uh, shallow water. And so as we started to see these river systems start to choke up and be essentially the river systems that we see today, we also saw these boats adapt their length to the resource. Another neat thing too was that the art of gigging uh, had started well before they had lights or had come up with the concept of gigging at night. And so they were bowing and spiking uh, and we'll get to that here in a little bit throughout the daylight hours. But uh, another thing that they had developed along with these longer boats was they learned that if they floated them down sideways, uh, they could cover more uh, area or volume of the river and harvest more fish. And so once they would get to the bottom of a hole, they would pull themselves back up, but then again would float down sideways so that they could cover more ground. So uh, this picture here is a prime example of a gig. Uh, most people are familiar with uh, the term frog gigging, or when they think of gigging, they think of frog gigging, I should say. Uh, fish gigging was something that uh, while they attribute it to early Appalachian culture, a lot of museums, um, a lot of historians in those regions, uh, even though they may have a sample uh, fish gig or a heavier gig that they call a throw gig, uh, they typically uh, didn't have any sort of background or see them in great volume. It wasn't until uh, a lot of those Tennessee natives at that point had moved into the Missouri Ozarks that we really started to see uh, the onset of these larger gigs coming into play. And they believe that a lot of that had to do with the interaction with the Delaware tribe. At that time, uh, the Delaware were known to uh, essentially use the bow and spike or the bow and arrow to harvest fish. Uh, and they believe that at that point, uh, the two um, backgrounds essentially kind of melted together and formed this new activity. And again, with the rivers at that time not being choked like they are today, uh, they believe that that's when the onset of the longer pole came into play to reach those deeper river levels. Uh, I've also talked to another historian that believed that uh, when they had used the rivers to transport ties, again, as I had mentioned earlier, they had used the river system not only uh, to get from point A to point B, but also to deliver goods. But they believed that uh, whenever they were moving ties up in, or down the rivers, that uh, the pike poles that were used to manage the tie rafts that were tied together uh, resembled a gig and a gig pole. Um, and they said that, you know, it's not outside the stretch of imagination that at that point they may not have started to attach gigs to those pike poles and using them. So while the history of gigging in the Ozarks is a little fuzzy, uh, we do know that that transition from Tennessee to the Missouri Ozarks is when we started to see these larger gigs, kind of like what you're seeing in this photo here. So another neat thing about uh, the gigging culture and history, uh, as I was coming up in the 80s and early 90s, uh, we had used gigs that were hand forged. Um, and that was really the onset of these came about uh, in mass production or what we considered mass production in the 50s and 60s. But uh, the cultural background with these gig makers that hand forged these gigs uh, was quite interesting. And as far as uh, local celebrity goes, uh, that's about how popular these individuals were. Uh, you had individuals in about each what we consider river town or township that was close to a river that would construct gigs. And a lot of it was out of necessity. Uh, typically they were blacksmiths or they were loggers that just blacksmithed on the side to supplement their income. And they would create a style of gig or a type of gig that worked well for them. And it wouldn't take long before their friends, family, neighbors took notice and would start coming around and asking if they could have a gig made. Uh, from this, again, there was a handful, 10, 15, that were well-known, uh, that created quite a few. Um, I have collected hand forged gigs for some years now, and we'll find a lot of gigs that were one-offs or maybe even a dozen-offs, and the individual, that was all they made was that run of them. And then we'll run into some like the Ellermans, uh, the Ray Hicks, 
Uh, and there's several other names out there where uh, they made into the hundreds and you'll find them every so often, but they're increasingly becoming more rare. Uh, one of the really unique things about uh, some of these gig makers was their preference on what type of metal that they would use to construct their gigs. And so uh, being from the area and having the opportunity to collect some of them, I've also had the opportunity to also visit with some of their children, which are getting up in their 70s and 80s now, and to hear some of the stories of how they came about finding uh, the steel for these gigs was quite interesting. Uh, one of them happened to be an Ellerman. He lives in Georgia now, but he had come through the park and uh, had made contact with me, and I was able to bring some of my gigs in to have him verify that his dad had made them, but just through conversation and talking, he was describing how his dad would go about making gigs. And he said, you know, the big thing for us was we wanted something around that post-World War II era, you know, something in the late 40s, early 50s. He said, but dad would send me after school to the junkyard. And while some of the gig makers really liked the leaf springs, the Ellerman gigs, they really focused on trying to get the bracket system off of the bumpers of those cars. They felt like once it was tempered that the steel was hard enough, yet it still had enough bend into it that if you were to hit one of the large chunk rocks that was in the water, your gig would bend, but it wouldn't break. And you could bend and kind of work it back into place. And that way that gig was used for decades upon decades. Uh, again, as I had previously mentioned, other gig makers really focused on different parts of the car, such as the leaf springs. Uh, but very interesting to me how each gig maker tried to make not only their pattern their own, but even the type of metal they were using their own. So again, some of that neat history that uh, we're quickly losing in the area. Uh, we're very fortunate that there has been some of uh, that history preserved. But again, it's an ongoing uh an ongoing project for us. So as the uh, production of these uh, hand forged gigs took place in 40s, 50s, and 60s, so did the different uh, style of gigging uh, progress. So one of the things we ran into at uh, this point was early on uh, after that big timber boom from the 1880s into the 1920s, uh, majority of the soft wood throughout the Missouri Ozarks was harvested, uh, that short leaf pine, and it left a residual amount of stumps in place. And you had individuals that were going out and finding what they called uh, pine knots, and they were using these pine knots to splinter up and using that pine pitch uh, to start fires, but also to uh, essentially light lanterns. But these lanterns weren't the white gas style that you see in this sketch here, these were baskets uh, called fire jacks or fire baskets. And they would put those pine knots in those baskets and they would try to get the fire itself anywhere from two to three foot is what I've been told, but uh, they felt like that provided enough light uh, to see fish at night. And that's when we started to see that transition um, after the 1920s, again, whenever they had access to all of those pine root wads, to where they were starting to gig at night. Uh, again, in the 50s and 60s, once we started to see those gigs uh, make their, uh, and again, I use that term mass production lightly because they were still hand forged, but they're very similar patterns. Uh, they all look alike, uh, at least for the gig maker. Uh, but as we transition into that era, we started to see a lot of that white gas being used with the lanterns. Um, and then people continued on eventually into uh, using electric lights. So the next advent, and again, it's hard to have a conversation uh, about gigging in the Ozarks without talking about John boats, is we started to see the John boat uh, enter its second evolution, uh, going from those long 26 to 30 footers uh, and coming back down into the 16 to 18 foot realm. Uh, when they did that, they also had brought in the prop motor and started using it. Now, again, we were still experiencing a lot of that runoff from the rock, uh, the debris from that logging boom. And so while we still would have some of the shallow areas, uh, there were still very deep pockets in this river system. It wasn't completely choked like what you see now. And so with that prop motor, they were able to put in a hole of water, 
uh, with either their white gas or electric lights at this point. Then they would make their way up and down a hole of water digging fish. And if they found themselves a hole of water that was producing extremely well, they could stay there and work it back and forth all evening. Um, with that, uh, some of the modern advances, and we'll get to those here in a little bit, but uh, once the river systems really started to become shallow, uh, the prop motor disappeared. And in the 80s, we started to see the advent of the jet motor, which is more of an impeller style motor uh, come into play. And that's currently what's used in the river system today. So making a jump, uh, for those of you that have not uh, seen a gigging setup up close or been paddling in the fall, uh, early winter, and possibly in the evening. Uh, we do have quite a few that do that along the riverway. But if you have not, these are good images of kind of how things have evolved uh, today. Uh, the view that you have in the top left is gonna be from the back of the boat looking forward. Uh, there are rails attached to the bow of most of these boats where lights are attached. And you will have two individuals that will stand up front with gig poles like they have previously used and gigs outfitted, and they could go upriver, downriver, uh, side to side, however they need to, uh, to best harvest fish. Uh, LED lights are kind of the newest craze. So uh, again, had mentioned that in the 80s and 90s when I was coming up, uh, electric lights were uh, really the cream of the crop. We would have them attached to a generator and uh, it'd sit in the back uh, next to either my dad or my uncle. So we worked our way up, but you know, there was a lot of exhaust. I've often laughed and said that that's what's wrong with me today was breathing in all the exhaust from that generator. But anyhow, uh, they did provide a nice soft yellow light, uh, which allowed us to see fish extremely well. Uh, in today's world, uh, they have kind of come full circle while the lighting system is better. Uh, with the uh, advent of these LED lights on the boats, We've been able to back off the generators and so it's less invasive as far as noise pollution and we can attach it to a deep cycle or essentially a car battery a starter battery works just as well but all you hear at this point now is the motor which they have these jet motors have moved to what's called a four stroke uh, so they don't take mixed gas now and so you have a quiet motor you have lights that are powered by a battery. So when you think about those early days, whenever they had those pine pitch baskets and they were pulling their way down the river, how absolutely quiet that must have been. While we're not quite there, we're getting pretty darn close. And it's really neat now that you can have a conversation in a boat as you're gigging and really not have to raise your voice. So interesting to see where it's come to today. Uh, the next thing that we run into are the gigs. So as I had previously mentioned, I find uh, a lot of interest in these hand forged gigs. Uh, I think it's an art unto itself and I've just really been drawn to them uh, throughout my life. And to see the transition into the new gigs where they are using CNC plasma cutters. Uh, these gigs uh, are much harder. Uh, they will not break, but they don't bend like the previous gigs did. Uh, they do stay sharp quite a bit longer, but again, these are CNC cut. And you'll typically find those at gas stations in the region selling anywhere from $65 to $100. And they're typically affixed to fiberglass insulated poles. So uh, the poles that you'll see a lot from are a lot of times being used by electric co-op um, or linemen. These are the poles that we look for. And again, we'll any, work them anywhere from 12 to 16 foot. Again, those 16 foot poles are uh, sought after still. But with that choked river system, with all the rock that's still coming into the current and Jack's Fork rivers, uh, starting to notice people using 12 foot poles, uh, just so they don't have that extra four foot of weight, uh, slowing them down. Again, as I would previously mentioned, the jet propelled motors are uh, a newer step, at least from the 80s, I consider them new. Uh, and then finally, moving from that wooden John boat uh, that we had seen early on into aluminum welded boats. Uh, the next thing that really was uh, the big uh, evolution is how we eat suckers. So typically as I had traveled across the US, uh, even across the pond, I was explaining this to folks and they were asking what type of fish they were. I was explaining you know, what a sucker fish was being a rough bottom feeder. Uh, the thought of eating that to some just could not wrap their mind around. 
Uh, then again, they had never seen a river system like the current river, the Jack's Fork of the 11 Point, with such clear uh, water, such clean water. And so when you're describing a bottom feeder in these uh, resources like these rivers, uh, you're dealing with a very white fish, uh, very good eating fish. The only thing that you do run into with these rough fish are the small uh, bones that you will find. So to prepare these fish, and I'm gonna come back to this slide, to prepare these fish, uh, typically what we'll do is arrive on land. And if you take a look at the top right, you'll notice an ironing board. And true to the Scott Irish background, we're not gonna let anything go to waste and we'll never throw anything away. So we have come to find that the ironing board works extremely well as a cleaning station, a portable cleaning station. It can be put in the boat, hauled to a river access, and per Missouri Department of Conservation's guidelines and request, they actually want all of the remnants of the fish that is not used to be put back in the water. And sometimes it can be a little unsightly the next morning if folks are putting in at these boat accesses. And we have received complaints before where folks said, you know, can't they do something else with these fish? but uh, it goes right back into the system. Uh, we will have small critters such as raccoons come and eat on them while they're in the water, but the turtles and crawdads do a very, very good job of cleaning up along with other fish species as well. So anyhow, the cleaning will eventually, or will start here on this uh, ironing board where we scale the fish. From there, we will fillet the sides off, and then we run it through a scoring machine. So Again, mentioning those 80s and early 90s, uh, I remember staying up extremely late uh, around these ironing boards that we used as cutting boards and taking a fillet knife and scoring down to the skin in roughly quarter inch size scores. And once you were done, you would toss it in cornmeal, which that's one thing about the Ozarks. We love everything fried and we like it in cornmeal but you would roll it around in cornmeal and you would deep fry it and those bones inside the fish fillet would crystallize. And so you could eat it much like a fillet. Now the skin is still attached. That's what's holding all the meat, so to speak, together, but you have taken the scales off of it. Again, extremely, extremely uh, good tasting fish. Now, let me back up uh, and say that the scoring machines, my bottom bullet point here, uh, so I mentioned standing around these ironing boards for hours on end, scoring those little uh, quarter inch score marks. Scoring machines have come in. And if you uh, think back to the old credit card swipe machines, that's essentially what a scoring machine is, where it has razor blades that are weighted down and you'll lay your fish fillet down and run it over that fillet and then push back. And it has scored your entire fillet of fish. So the whole process uh, has become much more streamlined, much more effective. Uh, it's become a common, common thing in today's world to brag about how fast you can gig your limit, clean, cook, be packed up and back to the house. And it's one of those things that uh, my dad and uncles have a great disdain for that. You know, they grew up uh, enjoying their time on the water, uh, staying out fairly late, uh, again, around a campfire visiting. And so the idea of speeding things up has really not taken to them. But I do have to say that a majority of giggers throughout the region have taken, uh, taken hold of some of these new practices, whether it be the new gigs, the new lights, uh, the new style boats, or even the scoring machines. Now species, I had kind of brushed over this slide. Uh, we had mentioned the rough fish. Uh, now drum will fall in that, carp will fall in that, but you don't see those species uh, until you typically get to the lower ends of the current river or the 11 point closer to the white. Uh, the three main that we will typically see along the rivers that I gig are gonna be the hog sucker, which is gonna be your top left fish. You have your white sucker, uh, sometimes referred to as a sand sucker, but a majority of it, folks will call it a white sucker. And then the bottom is gonna be your red horse. Now, the interesting thing about this uh, fish species is while they are alike, they are very different in how they move and when they move. So the hog sucker, uh, they call them sleepers. A lot of folks will, uh, hog mollies, there's several different names for them. 
that they camouflage extremely well into the river bottom here in the Missouri Ozarks, and they typically don't move. So if you are a novice gigger or you may have folks that haven't spent a lot of time uh, recreating on a gigging boat, they have a very easy time targeting these hog suckers. Uh, they're quick to reproduce, a great, great fish. Uh, but that being said, on the current river, special regulations have been put in place that each individual can only harvest five of these a night. And personally, I was glad to see this take place. Um, again, with the uh, onset and advent of all of these um, uh, evolutions in gigging, we also see a lot more folks out there. Uh, boats are easily accessible. Uh, you have people that have never gigged before that are on the water. And so with this abundance of individuals hitting the resource, I was very happy to see some active management take place, hoping to preserve some of the numbers. Now, the white sucker that you see on the top right, uh, very interesting as they are typically more of a wild or what we consider a wild fish, meaning that if you have a full moon, uh, if the water's not extremely cold, they move very sporadically and frantically. So trying to gig them or gig a uh, mess, as we call it, or uh, your limit of white suckers can be very tough and very daunting. Uh, but between those and the red horse, you will typically kind of have that mixed bag between the hog sucker, white sucker, and that red horse. I do get a lot of questions too uh, whenever I take novice giggers out and they say, you know, where should I hit the fish at? And so, you know, growing up, the younger folks or people that were new to the sport, uh, we were happy just to tell them, just hit the fish. We'll take care of the rest. So you may have a gig mark, you know, behind the dorsal fin. You may have one behind the head, which is excellent because you preserved that entire fillet of fish at that moment. But uh, the key to gigging fish, when you think of water and these lights and the refraction of the water, is to what we say, aim for the lips or aim for the snout of the fish. And typically at that point, the gig will hit just right behind the head of the fish. And again, as I previously mentioned, we'll preserve that entire fillet, which again, the goal at the end of the evening is to fillet these out and eat them. So uh, the more immaculate that you could keep that fillet, the better off you are. Now, going to this image, I know we had been at this slide previously, but if you take a look at that top left image, that is a prime example of where we hope folks will gig fish. Uh, when we take them out. As you can see, it leaves the rest of the fish um, unharmed uh, to where once we do take the sides off, uh, you have a nice fillet of fish to work with. Um, that being said, even if one does get hit in the middle, uh, very easy to work around. And again, very, very little of the fish uh, ever makes its way back into the water. Now, uh, I do get questions at this point as well. I had a previous volunteer with Missouri's Department of Conservation had asked me, uh, you know, we strive for a quick harvest um, with that agency. You know, that is something we promote through the hunter education programs, uh, through fishing that, you know, we never want any wildlife to suffer, uh, no wanton waste. And his question was, you know, when these fish are gigged, uh, is there any thought to, you know, do they suffer? And uh, the direct hit that they receive through their column uh, or head, their spinal column or head, uh, majority will be dead before they hit the boat. So we do like to pass that information along, just so folks don't think that, uh, you know, this is too barbaric of a practice. All right, now getting into regulations a little further. Uh, very interesting, whenever I was putting this slideshow together, I had reached out to our archives with uh, the Park Service and I said, I know that you're not gonna have much on fish gigging, but anything you could pull from the Missouri Ozarks on gigging, can you please send it to me? Well, this was the photo that I got, the only one that I got. And part of me had to start laughing at this point, uh, simply because as you could tell from their attire, this predates 1930s. Uh, and if anybody did not know this, uh, the Department of Conservation was founded in roughly 1936, or the Conservation Commission was, loosely. And at that time, uh, it was just a free-for-all. Uh, you could get mixed bags, you could gig whatever fish you saw. Again, this was more for uh, subsistence than it was for sustainability. And so if you take a look at the pole that they're holding up, the first thing I noticed was the large, large mouth. 
kind of off to uh, the right side of the image. But if you look close enough, you can also see frog legs hanging down. It looks to be a brim or a perch right next to it. So definitely a mixed bag of fish here. Uh, but again, it was very interesting to see uh, the four prong gig during this era. And again, going back to that transition from, uh, you know, the John boats uh, from the gigging or the Boeing and spiking where they were using one or two prong into that four prong. So this is probably one of the earliest photographs I have ever seen with a four prong gig, which is very interesting to me. Another neat thing uh, while doing research and going through the articles on regulations was the history of the regulations on gigging. And going back again to the 30s, uh, if you think trout have been in the Ozarks, uh, there's some debate on when they were introduced, but some folks do view trout as an invasive species within the Ozarks, even though they're still uh, stocked to this day. But they were a great uh, tourism draw. And in the 30s and 40s, whenever the Conservation Commission uh, was pulled together, you were dealing with a lot of individuals uh, from the two big areas of the state, St. Louis and Kansas City, that would vacation down to the Ozarks, but did not stay in the Ozarks. So whenever they vacationed, they were coming in to trout fish. Uh, it was a big draw. And so they were starting to notice that the trout that were in these riverways were being harvested by the Scott Irish Giggers. And so a petition went out to ban gigging altogether. And here in Shannon County, in Reynolds County, the neighboring county, they pulled together and a group of citizens uh, met in Jefferson City, uh, spoke with the commission, worked it over to where they said, all right, when would it be advantageous to the trout fishermen that we gig? And the trout fishermen came back and said, you know what, give them the last three months of the year. So that's where October, November, and December came into play. Now, since then, you know, we've kind of squeaked our way into September a little bit. So uh, bow season opener is September 15th and gigging season is the same day that evening. And then it was uh, at one point ending on January 31st, but in the last, I guess it would have been three years, four years, excuse me. I was still with uh, the Department of Conservation. They transitioned it to February 15th. And really to see how this has come full circle and what I got a big chuckle at knowing the history of this was that with gigging gaining popularity and ground, the extra two weeks was pitched as extra tourism for the area. They were able to bring in people from outside the area who were coming in to gig for another two weeks. So again, tourism was the beginning of the Ozarks and we're still right there in the threshold of it. Now, for the regulations on streams and impounded waters, uh, it is sunrise to midnight. At midnight, you have to shut your lights off um, or have your boat up on the trailer. We are at non-game species only now. So game species such as walleye, trout, bass, uh, catfish, you cannot harvest those with a gig. Your daily limit is 20. Uh, so the numbers are there. Uh, again, these are very prolific fish. And your possession limit is 40. So you can harvest 20 a day or have 40 total in your possession. And then just as I have mentioned earlier, you can only have five hog suckers for your daily limit, so 10 for your possession limit. Now, with all that being said, do we have any questions? Skylar, I got a couple for you. Yeah, lay it on me. So you talked about your interest in kind of some of the historical um, equipment and aspects of the sport. Yeah. Do you use like, the, do you use the modern equipment? Do you like to go traditional? Do you blend it all together? Um, uh, what's kind of your taste on you, that? They have, great question. Uh, they have gained so much traction in a niche market, uh, even financially, that at this point I do not use any sort of traditional equipment, uh, just collect. Uh, one of those that, again, I was very fortunate that growing up, I got to use that equipment. And in fact, our gigging rails were set up to where they were open on either end to where if your gig was bent, you could slide it in, you know, that gigging rail and bend it around so that you could get back to gigging. It wasn't like your gig was out of commission. So uh, my son and daughter, uh, my grandkids will not, you know, grow up knowing that or getting to use that 
but that is one of the unique things where I can say, you know, I remember a time before cell phones and I remember when we got to use hand forged gigs. Uh, that being said, with the LED lights, uh, I currently still use a generator simply because uh, the color of light that comes out of the old electric, uh, they are essentially a 500 watt shop light, shows fish a little better. Uh, but a lot of individuals I grew up with and I still gig with have switched over to the LEDs. But uh, yeah, for the most part, I just collect a lot of the old stuff now and try not to use it too much. Um, Sean had a question. Uh, he said, do you ever have to deal with poachers who try to skirt the limits or seasons or does everyone respect the, the seasons and tend to keep the skill alive and respect the regulations? Extremely, extremely good question. Um, you know, it, it's a very regional or a localized thing where we do deal with that a lot in the area, uh, but not necessarily in the gigging culture completely. So uh, unfortunately here in Shannon County, um, that is something that they're pretty well known for, whether it be deer dogging, whether it be, you know, spotlighting, over possession, uh, of wildlife or fish. So again, we do deal with that. Um, we do deal with individuals who uh, take species uh, that are game fish uh, over limits. But as gigging, as and I previously mentioned, has expanded out into other parts of the state and even other states, uh, you deal with a culture of folks that are very by the book. And you know that was very interesting to me growing up. I had previously mentioned, uh, you know, Brent and I being related and my mom coming out of the Perryville St. Jen area of the state was, you know, growing up, uh, I had kids that I went to school with that unabashedly, you know, were just brought up to harvest whatever they needed or wanted, you know, to, again, whatever they, they felt they needed or wanted. But anyhow, uh, once, you know, I started really kind of taking note of that and then getting to different parts of the state and traveling more. It was a breath of fresh air to find folks that were very by the book. So in a roundabout way, what I'm saying is here locally, uh, our conservation agents deal with that quite a bit. Uh, but as you spread out to different areas, different rivers, and, you know, different parts of the state and regions, you do not have that. People, again, are very respectful of it, very by the book. And again, uh, you know, with any, any sort of activity, a few bad apples can, you know, kind of ruin it for everyone. So uh, again, it's very good to see uh, as the sport of gigging grows, you know, people respect those limits and those uh, regulations. So I got another question for you. Yeah. Um, you know, you showed the three main species of sucker that you guys are uh, pursuing. Yeah. Um, out of those three, is there a taste preference? Like, do they rank in a certain order for you guys or do they all taste the same? And they're about like the same type of uh, yeah. scoring differ, you know, between the species. Yeah, the uh, the hog suckers will tend to, uh, and again, just in our terms, have a little more meat on the shoulders, be a thicker fish. Uh, so the fillets will be, you know, a little meatier. But again, you know, we have found several red horse and several, you know, yellow suckers of, you know, great size. Um, but again, as far as taste goes. Uh, once they are rolled in cornmeal and put in the grease, they're all about the same. It, it's the best fish I've ever had. Uh, fried fish, anyway. I mean, yeah, I was gonna say, good now, fried Todd, fish. you've had the opportunity to go out with uh, Rick Mansfield, one of the uh, parks yes. partners, correct? Yeah, I believe you. I thought you had. So, yeah, we we he actually uh, came after our kayak instructor class mm -hmm. in 2020, the fall of 2020, and so he took anybody who wanted to go out on his John boat and gig. And then there were four or five people that were staying at the, uh, the group campground, the middle landing there at Round Spring, and they were frying the suckers right there. And we had fried potatoes and suckers and yeah. coleslaw and beer. And it, oh, it was yeah. just outstanding. Just a great <laughs> well, evening. The whole kit and caboodle. Yeah, no, Rick is a great ambassador for the area. And, you know, with him doing that, uh, as you can probably imagine through uh, the presentation tonight and the conversation we're having that uh, this is not a, 
a cheap sport. Uh, it's not a cheap activity. And to get involved with it, uh, it's almost kind of an exclusive club where you have to receive an invite from somebody just to, so to speak, dip your toe in the water and see if it's something you're even going to enjoy uh, before you start investing this money into these, you know, gigging setups and outfits. And so, you know, Rick is a prime example of an individual uh, that is a true Ozarkian through and through and willing to invite anyone and everybody, uh, you know, out to do these activities uh, just to share what it is. And again, if you have an opportunity or an invite is extended to anybody, you know, in this uh, in this room tonight, please, please be sure to take it. Kind of an interesting story about Rick really quick. You were talking about your connection to, yeah. to Brent. Uh, Rick knows my uh, fiance mother, Catherine, very well because Catherine grew up in Ellington. And yes. yeah. she grew up in Ellington too. And so we were over at the log yard this summer and Rick had just done his stream team cleanup there at the log yard and come to find out there was a gentleman there that remember Jen's father and grandfather and her grandfather was John Boat Builder there in Ellington for years and years. Yeah. And Jen yeah. talks about eating sucker, not for fun, but because it was the only thing they could put on the table. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And yeah, again, it's very interesting to get into these areas and parts. Uh, you know, Shannon County is listed as, I believe it was the third largest in land mass uh, with one of the smallest uh, and most poverty-stricken populations. But uh, yeah, right now the county sits at about 6,000 people. So yeah, it's a uh, small world. And when we start, uh, you know, talking about folks, you may not know an individual specifically, but you at least know someone that they know. And so, yeah, Todd, you know, with your tie into the area, especially at Ellington, you know, a lot of familiar names and faces for sure. So, um, Skylar talked a little bit about the John boats and kind of the culture around that and tourism. Um, one thing that we did a presentation on last year, um, and we've talked about this in some of our ecotourism programs and that type of thing, is um, the, the John boat culture and the, the river guiding services that Jim Owen provided on the White River and the James, um, even up into the Finley, um, Kings, all those rivers kind of on our end of the uh, state. Um, so was there any big differences that you know of between the John boats that they were running on the current and Jack's Fork and 11 point versus what they were running a little further west? Um, yeah. I know that there was some crossover between some of the boat builders and mm -hmm. uh, that type of thing, just kind of based on my research. But was there any major differences? Not that I know of, but uh, going back, you know, and really kind of highlighting the differences of the gigs. Uh, you know, as you move from one area to the next, and what I really find fascinating about this generation uh, that had really jumped into the gig building and the John Boat uh, building was that they didn't do it for style. They didn't do it, uh, you know, for any other reason than functionality. So, you know, they may find something that worked in one region and they may bring that to their part of the world but it did not take long before they adapted it to fit their needs. And uh, again, if there was a big difference between this region and that region's uh, John boats, it was simply out of necessity. You know, it was something that they found, uh, you know, highly important to them. And again, with, uh, and I turned, I apologize. I, the name had slipped me through the presentation. But uh, the individual, and you will see, if you go back through some of the old archives with uh, Missouri's, uh, Missouri uh, or NDC's Conservationist Magazine, uh, I believe that they had had an article on Cecil Murray, who was down in the Donovan area, had done uh, a lot of jet boat or jet boat building, these John boat uh, builds, but his great, great uncle was John Murray. And so that's where the name John Boat had come from. But again, uh, if you could get into those, uh, the state of Missouri archives and go through some of those articles, uh, it's, uh, at least for me, was one of those uh, rabbit trails that I found myself, you know, on about a week long, you know, just kind of following and reading and poking along. And again, uh, as I kind of bring this full circle, one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning was it was extremely interesting to me that with the National Park, uh, coming into play, you know, you were taking not only the history of the area, but the cultural history of the area. 
and tying it into the resource. But as I have moved through my career as an educator in the area, not only being born and raised, but, you know, things that I had seen are cultural uh, uh, ideas or practices, you know, that have been in play for uh, generations, you know, being able to take a look even from like the 1880s to 1920s with that logging boom in the area, you know, how it uh, transitioned, you know, the softwoods into the hardwoods in here in Missouri and how we, you know, watch the deer and turkey population suffer, one, from lack of regulations, but two, they had different food sources to it, you know, causing the river systems to choke up to how we, you know, built boats, how we, you know, utilize the resource, whether it was using gigs or, you know, fishing techniques to extract from the rivers. Again, it all melds itself together here in the Ozarks. And the further you dive into it, the more research you do, you realize that every bit of it, along with these agencies, is intertwined. And it's pretty neat to see over time. Um, So Skyler had, you know, he's mentioned multiple times about the rivers filling in with gravel. Um, And some of you guys are probably aware of this, but, you know, with the logging boom, and the conversion of some of our, um, you know, land use practices changing. Um, we saw a lot of erosion take place on kind of the uplands, and that's really um, filled in a lot of the deep holes that were traditionally in our Ozark streams. We see we see the same thing um, in kind of the western corner of the state. Um, if you guys are interested about kind of some of this time period, one cool book that Todd and Loring Bullard turned me on to is Stars Upstream. Um, it's a great book about uh, the current Jack's Fork. I might recommend trying to find a copy of that. It's a really neat book to kind of learn about some of the history of this region. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Loring Bullard, uh, always, always good for a fun comment. Loring said that uh, he doesn't know about moving one of those boats sideways uh, in one of those long boats. Seems like a good way to take a bath. Um, I believe Loring <laughs> has been in a, uh, in a replica of one of those John boats before with Kyle Kosovich and he knows how nimble they are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that in the research or in some of these articles, uh, you know, that I had compiled and put together, they did make mention of that, that your head essentially had to be on swivel at all times or you would take a bath. So uh, yeah, I'm sure they were uh, wet as much as they were dry. Yeah. Sean had another question. He said, yeah. uh, I had a hard time telling the difference between the hog sucker that I ha- uh, that I can have five of and the white sucker that I can have 20 of um, on the slide. What's the best way to tell the difference in the water? It's, there's barring more on the hog mollies, right? Yes. And great, great question. Uh, so funny that you mentioned that about those two images. Uh, those were pulled from uh, the Department of Conservation's website. And when I first pulled them, I had them inverted as well. They look very, very similar. I will say that if you have the opportunity to get out and view the two um, underneath light at night, starkly different. The shape of them, uh, your hog sucker is going to have a bigger head and come down at a sharper V. I've always said that if you've ever had an aerial shot of a shark swimming in water in the ocean, that's how a hog sucker will move. Same with the yellow sucker, but they have those distinctive bands on the side, the hog suckers do. The yellow suckers, you won't see that ribbing or those bands. Uh, the images are pretty poor. That may be something that I try to um, upgrade in my slides. There's just not a lot of good pictures out there because, again, it being more of a localized uh, Southern Missouri thing, you know, the Department of Conservation has some good content on their website, but those images do look very similar. I agree. And when you're saying yellow, you're referring to the white suckers. Oh, or the whites or the yellows. Yeah. 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 Speaking of images, just kind of a really interesting image I forgot about until you were talking, Skylar. But, um, and I I can't show it very well. I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not, but this is a 19th century lithograph of two Highlanders in Scotland spearing salmon. And you'll, there it is. You'll notice the, uh, when I call it back up here again, the one guy's got a torch. Uh huh. Get the light just right there. He's holding it. I'll I'll send that to you. Yeah, send that to me. I, I, you know, in, one of these uh, research some names that, that you may hear pop up along with a lot of the research. Uh, the Park Service's archaeologist. Uh, he goes by Doc Price. Um, he had retired some time ago, but 
Doc had done extensive research on this in the area. He's at a, originally out of Naylor, Missouri, so down in that Boot Hill uh, area. But again, it's uh, very fascinating to me that between Tennessee and here, a lot of debate on when and where things really started to take place. And again, a lot of oral history in this area, not a lot of written history. So it uh, leaves a lot up to speculation, but very interesting to see that uh, because again, you know, it, it's tough to say exactly when, and you know, it may only have been a family or two that transitioned into this area and brought it. Uh, you know, I've heard stories even in modern times, the last 20 years of one individual that grew up here on the current and Jack's Fork River had moved to uh, uh, the DeSoto area and they started digging the big river and it took off from there. You know, people started buying boats and outfitting boats. And so, yeah, interesting, you know, and it may have just been one family that transitioned, you know, from Tennessee into the area and brought it with them. So, Well, if, if there are no other questions and, and what a great program, um, outstanding job, Skylar, it really was. We uh, really well, enjoyed this. Thank you guys. It, uh, again, it's a lot to kind of take in, um, again, you know, coming from the historical side, the resource side, the recreation side of the activity, uh, you know, and the big thing that we run into again, going back with ONSR is our goal is to take a look at the recreational uses in the park and make sure that everybody is represented. And a lot of times you get a misrepresentation based off of, we had made the comment about a few bad apples and every user group has them, but by highlighting some of these different recreation uses within the park, we hope to help a lot of the different user groups come together and understand why the regulations uh, that we put into play are there. So thank you guys for having me. It's been great this evening.